Okay, so our second presenter today is Adam to have none and he's one of our uh, rotating neurology residents and he's going to present a neuro ophthalmology case presentation. Today's case will be about a 34-year-old uh, female um, who was seen, obviously, in a uh, neuro-ophthalmology clinic. Our uh, history was pretty uh, unremarkable. Um, she did present to an outside ophthalmologist, basically with blurry vision in the right eye, um, which she had had a sty on that eyelid for several weeks, which she was rubbing. In the ED, she was evaluated, and uh, there was some concern um, that she had had papilledema uh, by the outside ophthalmologist. We didn't really concur with that. Um, we did a B scan looking for Drew's, and that was negative. Um, when she came to neuro-ophthalmology, her uh, vision was quite intact. She didn't have anything suggesting optic nerve dysfunction. Um, but on dilated exam, there was an indistinct margin of the right inferior disc. Um, and we did do autofluorescence, which was negative. So this is sort of a, a classic example. Um, unfortunately, this patient came late in the day, and we weren't able to photograph her. But her uh, exam looked almost identical to this. It was slightly more inferior. Um, but I think some of you probably know what we're dealing with here, but uh, this was a, a myelinated retinal nerve fiber. Um, and it has been described in the literature for quite some time since the 19th century. Um, but uh, typically, uh, you do see them unilaterally. A very small percentage will be in both eyes. These are found most often in children during routine exams. Uh, and it doesn't really appear that there's a disposition to women or men. Um, and the studies on autopsy show that it's probably present in about 1% um, in a large series in Japan that looked at people just presenting to an ophthalmology clinic. And uh, it was less prevalent. Um, the presentation, when it is symptomatic, is uh, Typically, um, visual field deficits, uh, it does spare the macula. There are reported cases of involvement of the macula, which would produce more dramatic uh, field deficits. But um, overall, the prognosis is quite good. Uh, in children, you will see axial myopia and amblyopia. And this can be resistant to therapy. Um, in cases where it is very, very extensive, it could be uh, consistent with uh, leukocoria, which in that age population you would think of retinoblastoma. Um, and if uh, intervention is needed, it's typically because of uh, neovascularization or vitreous hemorrhage. That appears to be quite rare, though. Characteristics, uh, typically it's not progressive. There are cases of progressive uh, myelinated retinal nerve fibers. And one was described here at the Moran of an adolescent with a seven-year interim between appointments had uh, quite a dramatic uh, progression. Some of this may have to do with disruption of the lamina cribrosa, which I'll go into in a second. There has been regression documented. Uh, this usually follows an insult, uh, such as optic neuritis or glaucoma, appear to be the most common. Um, it is associated with some conditions, such as neurofibromatosis, Gorlin syndrome. Uh, and there are reports of familial cases that 
do not have a genetic basis, but it is a hallmark of the autosomal recessive spastic ataxia of Charlevoix and Saguenay. Um, and when you see it, uh, the key to the diagnosis is the feathery or frayed edge. Uh, and I think you'll notice that on a few examples that I'll show in a second. Um, they, of course, are, are quite white, uh, the myelin um, producing that. And they, they track along the nerve fibers, which makes sense, but they're not always contiguous and they're not always contiguous with the disc itself. So you can see them separated by you know, a, a significant amount from the disc. When they are around the disc, it's very easy to mistake them for nerve edema. Um, also, you know, cotton wool spots, uh, other things that you guys see that I don't like retinal infiltrate and uh, epiretinal membranes. They can obscure vessels either partially or entirely and there can be neovascularization that's associated with them. So just a quick note on optic nerve myelination. Uh, it proceeds from posterior to anterior and it begins probably about five months. Some authors have said eight months. But by the time it reaches the lamina cribrosa, it should stop there. Um, and by full term, that process should be complete. One model that um, illustrates how important the lamina cribrosa is is uh, rabbits who do not have a fully developed lamina. And it's a normal variant for them to have myelination past the lamina. So the etiology is subject to debate, but people, of course, do think that the lamina is probably involved. Um, one theory is that the oligodendrocytes arrive embryologically before the lamina is fully formed. Another is that the astrocytes who secrete what is thought to be a, a inhibitory protein uh, may be dysfunctional in these cases. Other um, cases of progressive uh, myelinated retinal nerve fibers show disrupted lamina cribrosa from tumors, trauma, surgery. So. Uh, while the etiology is not clear, uh, certainly it has something to do with that. On studies of uh, EM, you see axons of varying uh, uh, size as well as varying degrees of myelination, and we'll look at a couple pictures of that. I just wanted to show some retrobulbar optic nerve axons, um, very nicely myelinated uh, and pretty uniformly myelinated. This is a nice picture showing the transition zone from myelinated nerve fiber to uh, unmyelinated, and you can see the lamina there quite nicely. Uh, here's a, a study um, of uh, nerve fiber um, that is myelinated, and you can see these fiber bundles uh, coming through. And actually, there's an area here that uh, is not myelinated, and then the myelination begins subsequently. And these are, these are uh, from humans. Here's an uh, abnormal myelination. Um, and one thing to point out is that um, you can see that, you know, there are degrees of myelination that vary quite dramatically here in these nerve fibers. The axons are very disparate in their size. And then there are nerve fibers that aren't myelinated. So there's a mix. And generally, I'd, I'd characterize it as disorganized. Um, so uh, I'd like to thank Julie Shelton, uh, who was the fellow last year who did some work that is actually uh, going to be published um, on alternative imaging methods. Uh, here we see a, a classic case. This is a very nice feathery frayed edge uh, coming off the disc here. On OCT, um, we see a thickened nerve fiber layer. Uh, and presumably that's the myelin or the increased size in the axon, probably the myelin. Um, this very dark uh, image here was autofluorescence, um, which didn't show anything suggestive of drusen. And then we have um, red free and uh, infrared, which actually demonstrate the myelinated fibers quite well. Uh, here's a second case, and what I liked about this was it's not contiguous with the nerve, obviously. We again see on the OCT that there's thickened uh, nerve fiber layer. Um, on uh, autofluorescence, we, this is actually autofluorescence here, we see blocking, um, so it's a negative autofluorescence. 
And then uh, red free and infrared, we see that again, it's highlighted quite well. So this would be the first published case um, of OCT being used um, in this manner. Uh, and it you know, appears to correlate quite well. Uh, so hopefully that will be something that will be uh, used in the future. Okay, any questions?